Let me ask you this. Did you watch the Roddy Piper biography last Man, night on eight? You know what? I forgot to set the DVR for it. I really wanted to watch it. I got to find a way. There has to be another way to see it, but I have not had a chance. But yes, but I really there's want another to. way. They're going to rerun these things 15 times a day. They've already. As a matter of fact, I don't typically <laughs> bump into A and E if I'm not tuned into A and E. So I have no idea oh, what they come do. Come on. That. What? You watch a lot of A and E? Well, they've got fine programming. Like what? Well, as, as uh, and all kinds of things. Yeah. But besides that, exactly. um, but no, there are. Well, biography for one. It's it's a, sh- a valid show. It's a long running, highly popular show. They didn't just all just start up doing wrestling. But A and E's a, a fine network. They use their left and right turn indicators. But anyway, no, you were gonna watch it. I know you were, and then you forgot because you. You got too many things going on, but they have taken over A and E Network practically because the Austin biography from last week was run again from six to eight Eastern, and then Piper from eight to ten, and then that the Treasure Show, the Treasure Show was rerun from last week, and uh, I did not watch the Treasure Show because I went sleep. And as a matter of fact, I had to watch the last thirty minutes of Roddy today. Because I was trying to stay, I kept, I would go to sleep on the last half hour. I'd wake up and it just finished and I'd run it back on the DVR and I'd start playing it and I'd wake up again. I did that like three times and finally I said, fuck it, I'll do it tomorrow. But that's because I'm old and I had a big day of figure packing. Because Lord knows figures need to be packed. You know, with that treasure show, I DVR'd the first one. I forgot the DVR also that one, but I'll find a way to catch it. One of the wrestling historians and wrestling collectors out there texted me after the first one, the Mick Foley episode. Apparently, they went to some wrestling collector's house to get the memorabilia. And this well-known wrestling collector texted me, who the fuck is this guy? (laughs) (laughs) So I don't even know who these people are. Who the the fuck is this guy? And I love the New York grammar up there. Well, they have found, because... For their purposes of that program, they say wrestling collectors are people who collect modern WWE memorabilia. Whereas for purposes of older, more serious, more uh, more broad historians such as ourselves, who are you calling abroad? Um, we consider people like the gentleman that you're speaking of a collector because they have things of all the world of wrestling, the vintage items, modern things, different uh, genres and countries and et cetera. And, and not just, you know, uh, fucking Billy Gunn's tube socks from the attitude Era. So you snob. Yeah. Well, do you think think they're setting up, is this series setting up a hall of fame? They're going around collecting all these things to put them in the warehouse. Like that's not a good ending to the show. We've bought, we want to buy this from you so we could just put it someplace that no one will ever see it. Well, I, I did hear also from a couple of people that a couple of the more serious collectors that they contacted. The problem with it, that is that I know, and I won't out those people either, but I know a couple of different real serious collectors that they contacted that wouldn't sell their shit. See, that the real serious, they don't want to sell their shit. And they were offering some stupid money for things that they wanted because it's a television show. It's the same thing as they don't really... Apparently now we've found out that Storage Wars is a work and they don't really pay those thousands of dollars for that either. But um But if you want to get more money out of the deal, just tell them that Tony Khan offered you something. Yes, because he's going to set up the Bizarro World <laughs> Wrestling Hall of Fame. But anyway, so we'll talk about the Treasure Show cuz I'm watched that either. We'll talk about that this week if there was anything going on. But as far as the Roddy biography, I want to talk about it for a minute here today and then you'll just have to catch up uh, when you can, because I loved it, ex- except for one glaring thing. So I will say the things that I liked first. So we're more positive because Roddy was, even though I didn't get to see him live often before I got in the business, when I was still a fan, he was one of my favorite wrestlers and it really didn't even get to see him that long uh, while I was still a fan before I got in the business because the videotape era only started like, you know, 80, 79, 80 ish. And so we saw the tail end of Portland, then saw when he went to the Carolinas 
but I'm the promos and the fucking he he was different in every way. We talked about this. Well, God, it may have been now so long ago when he died, but he had a different way of, of working his body language and the way that he worked than everybody else. He always looked like he was in a fight. He even did the fucking, the boxing stagger kind of thing. Um, his intensity where he would, he wasn't a big guy with jacked up arms, but he, when he got on somebody in the ring, it was vicious and he was into, and you could see the facials and it, it I actually saw him legitimately get on somebody and uh, you know when he would get on the top of you and he'd fire those quick rights right you know what i'm talking about when he was getting yeah. the heat on the fucking baby face of course i saw him get the heat on a mark the exact same way in the cincinnati gardens in the fucking aisle way and with the with the result that the mark got carried out and his feet were twitching but this guy to one swing at piper and he boom he hit him three times before he dropped and then he was on him boom 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 um you know, he just, it was, he was different. And then you combine that with the promo and that whatever era he was in or whatever he was doing, whether you thought he was a complete lunatic or whether you thought he was a fucking charming baby face or whether you, whatever he was doing, the same thing as the Austin biography last week. You believed that guy, even if you didn't believe the business, you believed that guy. And um, you're going to love this show because Gene LaBelle was in it. What is Gene LaBelle now? 87? I was wow. going to say, he has to be close to 90, yeah. And my God, he he almost steals it as a personality, uh, as you would imagine, because, of you know, if you know anything about Gene LaBelle, but um, they got him, they got unprecedented access to his family, his daughters, uh, Colt, his son, um, Kitty, his his wife, and they had family uh, home video and pictures and older stuff. So that was tremendous. And and nobody can really tell the story of Roddy's troubled childhood because nobody really knows what the fuck it was. He would only, you know, shade at it a few times every once in a while, and they couldn't even articulate. But he was just such a complicated guy. So the the personal side was covered much better than last week's with Steve. The, uh, um, you know, uh, the one, I'll go ahead and mention the one glaring thing now. It's a, you're going to go crazy because of the being the wrestling historian and purist and, you know, you're even more anal about these things than I am. I'm willing to let some things slide because either chronologically or whatever, because how do you tell these things in a short video format? But you are led to believe from the way that they edited this, at least, that Roddy left Portland and went straight to do color commentary on Atlanta TV. It's not surprising and, that they would screw and, that up. But, and, and, and I know, and, and Bruce Pritchard's going to take a lot of heat because it, the way they edited it, I know he knows better than this, but the way they edited it, it, it edited it, it sounds like that he was saying that. Uh, but so they and then after they had covered him being a color guy on Atlanta TV, then they started showing him and Flair and they started showing Mid-Atlantic Wrestling highlights and Crockett highlights and the dog collar match with Valentine and etc. Never mentioned Jim Crockett's name or Jim Crockett promotions once. It was like they conflated that Atlanta and then that it, it, that footage would would be the same place when in actuality obviously it wasn't until Crockett bought Atlanta fucking 3 or 4 years later so but that's it, it, that was so jarring because all of a sudden I'm waiting and they covered there's some great footage from Los Angeles that you wouldn't think would be around somebody had an early VHS machine and uh and Gene LaBelle and and etc covered Los Angeles and Portland there was some good footage from Portland, and then all of a sudden he's on Atlanta TV. I'm like, what the fuck? Where did the Carolinas go? Because that was, what was, I don't even have the record book in front of me, but he had to debut for Crockett sometime in 1980. 1980. Or, okay, but I think he was you. there from 80 to 83 with a small window yes. where he claims he was blackballed. 
Well, I think the small window at one time was where he, <laughs> I always heard that he told guys in the business, he just wanted to go down to Pensacola, make a grand a week where he could do all the shit he wanted to do. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, so the point is he comes to Jim Crockett promotions in 1980 and with all respect to Portland and Los Angeles, because when he was in Los Angeles, it was the you know, some what final days of LaBelle, all of a sudden he's with Flair and Wahoo and Steamboat and the best NWA talent in the best NWA territory. And he's blowing past everybody because that's when we first started. When, when uh, Crockett got TV on in Cincinnati, uh, you could also, you could on channel five, it was, I think it was noon. Now it couldn't have been noon. That would have been opposite. Jared's show but anyway it was either 11 o'clock or maybe it was noon on sunday whatever the fuck even with my high-powered antenna noon in the middle of the day you could only get fucking very snowy pictures and a little rough audio on channel five from cincinnati and i would sit there through the whole thing hoping that piper was going to do a local promo it wasn't even recordable but i would want to listen to hear him fucking talk and you know, that uh, that was where he really, you know, became. And what what would you think? Obviously, more people then saw starting in 84, the stuff in the WWF and the MTV stuff and WrestleMania, et cetera. But if you're a wrestling fan and you want to collect the best Roddy Piper interviews and the best in-ring matches, it's his period of time in Mid-Atlantic for Crockett, right? Certainly in-ring, I think. I mean, you can't say anything. Well, his run in Portland was great. And him and Playboy Buddy Rose really defined that era for well, so many true. people. And the promos. He had even more he had even more of uh, of uh, leeway in yeah. Portland than he did for Crockett. But just interacting with the 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 talent that he interacted with in, in Crockett. And you remember even before they went out to the arenas when they got the Nemo truck, when they were still doing the studio show at WRAL in Raleigh or whatever, and he's He's down in, they showed a clip of this. He's down in front of the goddamn desk. Bob Caudle's freaking out and fucking Piper's screaming and he's got the belt. And he just, he was, he blew everybody, even sometimes Flair, off the screen in mid-Atlantic wrestling when everybody was the best that they could be. Well, that was one of the things. Flair already in 79, early 1980, was considered by many future world champion, one of the best promos in the business one of the best in-ring guys in the business. And all of a sudden you drop Piper in there and he's out talking everyone. And that got him over. You have him and Flair, the two best talkers in the business going at it back and forth. And it worked. And then also it, he was just so different. They'd seen every other kind of ever, but they'd seen Snuka. They'd seen Orndorff. They'd seen every style of wrestler, but Piper did, as I said before, didn't work like anybody else. And I can't, I mean, I'm sure he, took things from people i think he took more ideas than moves or more ideas than ways of doing things it seemed like everything he did in the ring and every way that he worked the way he moved it was always him but i can't think of anybody he copied or anybody that's really ever got being him down every they copy everybody else who works like who has worked like roddy piper since piper got big 35 years ago not too many. I mean, it used to drive me crazy when Moxley was Dean Ambrose and he first came up to the main roster and people said, oh, he reminds me of Roddy Piper. He reminds what? me of Terry Funk. And big, why? Because he looks like he hasn't showered? Why? <laughs> hey, on behalf of Terry and, and Roddy, I take exception to that. They took regular showers. And <laughs> sometimes it just didn't look like it. But but anyway, so in the biography special, besides skipping over that, and then the, they obviously went into heavy detail on the, the you know, WWF run, beginning with uh, WrestleMania, et cetera. And obviously, you know, that story has been told. And I think that's what we're going to, what we're going to see from these shows is Austin was easy because Dallas, and they really skipped over USWA, but Dallas to WCW, to WWF, to Global Icon. For a guy like Roddy that went to multiple territories and it goes farther back in time and 
you know, these shows are never too much about listening to exact historians who will point out their, you know, flaws. If they get to somebody, who else is on the, the list? We had that last week. And it, but the point the is, top of my head, of, yeah, there's Randy Savage, Booker T. I wonder how much footage of ICW television they're going to have for Savage. I've probably got more ICW TV on tape than anybody except, well, maybe Angelo Poffo had it when he, you know, but, um, it, it's going to be, it's going to be more frustrating for wrestling historians who actually know what, how, how they, these stars emerged when it gets farther back and they have less tape and they decide to start skipping over shit. And they have Brett and Sean. So let's see how they're going to play up Montreal on this thing. Oh Lord. I've <laughs> Ultimate Warrior. That could be interesting. Mick Foley. I, w- I wonder there's not a lot of footage of Warrior or, or Sting in Memphis. I had when they did a a uh DVD on Sting in TNA, Jeff Jarrett asked me to find the what five weeks that Warrior and Sting were in Memphis and copy it. And I think I found most of it and copied it for him. That was 15 years ago and i don't know where i put the i put the vhs's back on the shelf but i I, you know they're they're if they do warrior they're they're probably gonna start out with uh would you show that would you show if you're doing a biography on somebody that was a big major wrestling star would you show any of that memphis stuff where it was so bad the people in studio audience were laughing at them or would you just kind of gloss over that? If you're going to tell the story, you have to show it. But I kind of think for the warrior, between that stuff and some of his off-color remarks, maybe you should just make it a kayfabe biography. Like he, <laughs> he landed on the planet two million years ago. You know, just <laughs> tell some fantastical story like he did in his promos. Uh, but it and and back to the Roddy bio. Um, the last part of it's really sad, and it was sad to to watch Kitty talk about, you know, everything. Do you remember right before he died, he did an interview and I'm trying to think what the host show, it it was the logo was on there, but I can't remember what show it was. It may have been on ESPN or something, but it it got clips of it got sent around uh, at the time because he obviously just couldn't, he couldn't keep a train of thought. He couldn't, make a complete sentence and everybody's like, Oh, what's going on with Roddy? And, and that was, they were going to take him to the doctor to see what had caused that the, the morning or the day after he passed away that night at in bed at home. And she talked about that, which it, 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 even then, as much as he was traveling, there was a possibility that could have happened not at home and she was glad that it did and that's on an unrelated note why you ain't gonna see me in too many hotels from now on for the rest of my fucking life but um but you know that was sad and i was thinking my god i you know i mean when you hear somebody not making sense in the wrestling business you think of other things and but i had been talking to roddy i talked to roddy more the last six months that uh, of his life than i ever had in my life after all that time of being a fan of his, he was another guy we barely ever worked in the same place. I got to get knocked out by him at WrestleMania 10 that time when he was the special referee. And, you know, we had done a, the promo I got to do in Louisville that I've talked about uh, on the WWF pay-per-view. Um, but we didn't get to work together uh, very much or even in the same place a lot. But he had started doing a podcast. And I hate this was what six or seven years ago because now with podcasts roddy would be phenomenal you know it was still a emerging thing back then but he had started doing a podcast and i'd done two or three spots on it and he had just asked the last one i did i'll tell you a story about his co-host in a minute but he had asked hey you want to do something once a month yes roddy piper asked me to be on his show once a month of course i will do that yes and that's the last time I ever talked to him. Um, but the first time I did his show, and, and the guy's name is Earl Skakel. Or Earl, if you're out there. Um, uh, but you know how Roddy sometimes he was he had that way of speaking. He'd slur a word every now and then. And we weren't doing this on Skype then. I was on my fucking phone. He'd just call me on the phone right here at the house. 
So he had introduced his co-host to me as Earl Skakel, and I thought he said he's Canadian. So later on in the program, Earl said something trying to be funny or whatever, and it kind of fell flat. And I said, well, Roddy, don't blame him. He's a Canadian. And Roddy said, what? I said, I, I thought you said he was a Canadian. He said, and Roddy said, no, I said, he's, he's a comedian. I said, oh, well, as a fucking comedian, he makes a good Canadian. And for whatever reason, that tickled him, and he started calling his co-host a Canadian instead of a comedian. I don't know, but that was funny to us at the time, but it, because Roddy was involved. It's not funny if Roddy's not involved. And Roddy's in Canadian. And, and Roddy's, that's why he thought it was funny. Yeah, I don't, anyway, it, see, Roddy would have made that all brilliant. But it, it, so it, they're obviously doing these shows, all of them, for the wrestling fans, obviously, for the ratings and et cetera. So it's heavily, but it's not, like I said, it's not the wrestling fans like you and me that know every fact and figure. It's the wrestling fans that used to watch these people on their television so uh, all of those people are going to enjoy these shows immensely and you're going to you see shit you you know you had haven't seen before because they've got access to the family or whatever but uh there's going to be you know just uh, the bigger the star the more glaring the the bios but skip skipping crockett for piper is like skipping the nazis and bruno's mother for bruno you know it, it just that's a big big deal if that was the only problem, I'm surprised. It's a WWE documentary. I know that A&E, you know, I can tell you that I heard from people at A&E, they were frustrated with working with WWE because they always want to have control over everything. Oh, the, now the one, the one thing that they did do is remember when Roddy cut the promo on HBO or whatever it was about you know, all, all my friends are, yeah, yeah, real sports. All my friends are dying and the company, they don't care. <laughs> they made sure to put in right after that they apologized and made up and he was in the Hall of Fame a year later. Oh, not that they immediately uh, fired him and he was taken off TV? Vince said, well, you know, you just got to say, uh, uh, we got to part ways, pal. <laughs> Vince, Vince on these looks like he's melting somehow. What oh, and th voice? there was. He hated cigarettes, yet he sounds like the smoker now. Well, it's because he's been doing that fucking gimmick voice all those years. But um, the opening got some cringes from some people because vince is apparently sitting there waiting to do the take and he has his cell phone he's hey roddy roddy how you doing pal uh, what uh it must be hot down there oh, oh god oh, come on because vince because he thinks he's being funny right but okay i love you too or whatever hey it's you're saving a place for me not too soon pal okay bye it's roddy he, he he's not really in hell <laughs> and, and, you know, like, what he just he said roddy's not really in he's hell. doing bits now and biography he was doing a bit for the fucking producers and they 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 aired it he's become like the old man who wants to make a quarter disappear <laughs> watch this you can't find it it's behind your ear it. i know how he could do it <laughs> he could hide a stack of them up triple h's nose <laughs> All right, but this is your show. It is my show. I did want to ask you on the topic of A&E's biography. So A&E now has biography and WWF's hidden secret treasures that we know about or whatever the name of the show is. Yeah, they, they, that's the thing. Again, the premise is we got to we got to re recover and rediscover these these lost treasures. So let's call the guy up that's got it and go buy it from him. So those two shows are on A&E. TNT, they have AEW Dynamite. There's supposed to be a second AEW show starting at some point soon. And then I'm going to classify the Cody and Brandy Rhodes reality super show as being part of the wrestling content. USA Network, two WWE shows, right? And then they have the Miz and Mrs. And then you have the WWE on Fox. And then, do they know which is which, by the way? <laughs> and then on Vice, Dark Side of the Ring. Now well, and by the way, let's let's not let the opportunity go by to remind everybody that if you've been longingly aching to see my smiling face on television again, your chance starts on uh, May the 6th with the season three debut of Dark Side of the Ring, two hours on Brian Pillman. I'll be featured on that program. And we're, we're going to have uh, Evan and Jason the creators and uh, behind the scenes of major domos of dark side on the experience this week. 
Um, but yes, uh, Dark Side and and they're they're replaying the previous seasons uh, on a liberal basis on on Vice as well as the new season that starts on May the sixth, and that'll be a set of seven episodes. I think of the, that'll be the first half of the season, and then they're going to take a break and do the second half. Well, as I was saying, Vice has that show. And yeah. now a limited run with MLW showing their archives. That's I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, so instead of Vice, it, it should be Vice Lock. So you're seeing a lot of interesting things where networks that weren't traditionally in wrestling are now getting in wrestling and wrestling themed content. And as much as a wrestling TV show doesn't do what it used to do, and you look at the yeah. numbers and you dissect it. It's interesting, so many of these other shows about the culture of wrestling, the subculture of wrestling, the ecosystem of wrestling, are getting picked up and put out there on TV now. What do you think that says? Sometimes even the skeletal system of wrestling. The first thing it says to me is, in Jerry Lawler's immortal words, where were you motherfuckers when I ran this town every week? We had television shows about wrestling shows that five times as many people watched as they're watching now, whether it be on cable or on broadcast. And the stations wanted us to pay to put them on. And now there's literally a fifth of the number of people watching these programs as there used to be, and they're paying everybody to fucking air them. It, it, what has happened? What has happened? And secondly, and, and, and the second part of your question is, I'm not at all surprised that the shows about the culture of or the behind the scenes of wrestling are are flourishing as much, if not more, than the wrestling programs because that's the only goddamn interesting thing about wrestling these days, and at least people know or believe that that is somewhat real and legitimate. You know, A&E for the biography series with WWE, they're getting $20,000 a spot, which is... Pretty good, I would think, for a smaller size cable station like that. I would think so. Vice, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to Vice and get some spots, but A and E twenty thousand dollars a spot. Well, Jim, let's get some questions here. Were you were you thinking of advertising our program over there? I wasn't Why thinking you got the, the got the quote. I wasn't thinking of that, but someone who I know has talked to the network. Ah. Relayed back to me some of the prices, and I said, my God, it's cheaper than this show. <laughs> what the hell are they doing over there? But anyway. A stooge report. You got a stooge report. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I got a report about what was actually transpiring and taking place. <laughs> That's the same kind as Grizzly Smith used to give. So a stooge report. Well, let's not compare me to that dirty bastard, but Jim... No, you would be the one getting the report. He would be the one giving the report. Okay, well, I still want nothing to do with him. But <laughs> on that topic, Jim, I can't think of any way to transition one of our sponsors here. So I guess I'll be going to our first you question. You know, I'll tell you what. Yeah, you, tell me, please. <laughs> if you would like to have a good night's sleep, if you would like to have a good night's sleep and forget the experience of having listened to this program, then I can think of no way that you will sleep finer than on a Helix sleep mattress. Like you're floating on a cloud, like you're curled up in the belly of a warm puppy, a warm, loving puppy with soft fur. You will sleep and dream of butterflies and rainbows on the helix sleep mattress that's exactly how pleasant it is because what you do is you pick out the mattress that you want not somebody else's mat they're not going to send you a mattress that somebody else wants to sleep on or has slept on in the past no you get one tailored for you and brand new you go at Hel do helix sleep i should say h-e-l-i-x helixsleep.com and you take a quiz that takes about two minutes, and you talk about your sleep preferences, the positions, your body type, blah, 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 and then they pick for you the mattresses that most fit your requirements. They've got soft, medium, firm, cool-down mattresses, plus-size mattresses, not mattresses that are bigger, but mattresses that are for bigger people. I didn't even know they made those. Anyway, 
They match you up with the model mattress that you match up with, and then you order the thing. And if you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners while you're ordering that mattress. Helixsleep.com slash JCE. And then when it's delivered, you get to open it up and watch it unfold in front of your very eyes, which is part of the entertainment. Because it, it does. there's not going to be six people carrying this thing and they can't even get it in the door. It comes in a box and you can set it where you want it to go, open it up. It's not like an I Love Lucy life raft. It will slowly go until it's fully formed. It's a marvel, a marvel of engineering. Helixsleep.com slash JCE to sleep on a model of engineering. 